We've sort of moved into the library, which is again, which is nice because it's a relatively intimate space. We talked before about the different scale of rooms. We've come out of the grand room into the library, which is again a room uh, that, that is intimate and, and, a, and a good place to sit and visit. Uh, and we've invited uh, Thomas Fulmer, who's the director of education at the Rachofsky House, uh, to join us uh, and visit a little bit about our programming and, and what we do here to try to. Uh, the overused term of community outreach, but it's really about trying to present the opportunity for people to explore art and architecture in, uh, you know, in an intimate environment that uh, doesn't have a bookshop and, <laughs> and isn't uh, selling souvenirs. Uh, uh, and so, Thomas, welcome. Uh, and maybe, uh, Adrian, you have some questions, perhaps, for Thomas. Uh, perhaps you could tell us about uh, the types of tours that are done here. And what is the population who comes in, and how one goes about scheduling a tour of the Rachofsky House? Absolutely. Well, on a really practical level, we have um, middle school through university students, basically, mm -hmm. and also we do a lot of programs for adults. Um, and the way to schedule tours basically to just call or email. It's really straightforward. And I think one of the really amazing things about coming here as a school group is that when you come to the Rachofsky House, you are the only group in the house. So there's a real um, intimacy and a kind of focus to the experience that you you know that you don't have in other spaces because it's a home and yeah. and um, you know there's just a different quality to the experience and to the tone of the time here and the experience with the work so that's yeah, a really that's super and do you conduct these tours yourself absolutely okay. so we have you know the tours can can exist on the, in a variety of ways either as a guided tour as a looser tour where the students have time to work on their own or to sketch or to write. Um, a lot of times teachers want a combination of those things. They want some time outside where the students can sketch and, and do some writing and some more reflective work. And then they want um, some time inside that's more structured, more guided, where I'm walking through with the students and giving them information and kind of leading the questions and the discussion. Now on your website, do you list mm -hmm. the works that you currently have up and the, the theme uh, of the exhibition? Absolutely. The curator statement and then the installation checklist are online now. Mm -hmm. All right. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's rachofskyhouse.org? Exactly. Right. And what do you want a phone number or do you just uh, or an email? I guess that is the email address. Yes. I'm an old school guy. I still well, use phone, the phone. phone is fine too. <laughs> Would you like to give us a telephone sure, number? Sure. Um, the education line is 214-373-3157. And then I, maybe we should chat a little bit about the work in the, in the library. It, this side of the collection really deals with uh, sort of psychology and the, and the issues of identity, sort of the primary mo postmodern notion of uh, an inquiry uh, in our society basically for the last three decades. Uh, and so we have works by uh, a few artists in here, all representational in nature, but dealing with the very personal uh, psychological side of, of, of this uh, collection. Uh, and I'll point out the works and we can walk through uh, if you'd like right now. Anyway, as we were talking about the psychological side of the collection, and parenthetically, I, this coat, this jacket, it was not meant to match the Gustin painting, but it evidently fits in. Um, this is a wonderful work from 69 uh, by Philip Gustin. And again, I don't like getting caught up in the, in the, uh, you know, in dating works, a lot of people are getting very preoccupied about this was made in this year or that year, and that was pivotal. And I think that's interesting in some cases, but for the most part, not critical. Uh, this work, a figurative work, well, among the early figurative works after he went through this great, had this great success as an abstract painter. And this work uh, really has these two hooded figures, clansmen, if you will, with the architecture in the background. Uh, and it's questioning this. Uh, I view this as him questioning himself. This is sort of him and his alter ego, the dark side and who he is. And, and all they're hidden beneath the, the, you know, this this cloak of secrecy, which I think these clan figures are really a metaphor for for who we are and how we hide ourselves. And this is sort of I view this as sort of him confronting himself. The sort of the classic inquiry of sort of who in the hell am I? And I think that's what this work is about. And this is a wonderful early painting by Georg Vosslitz, the German painter, 
from 1963, I believe, uh, and it's called P.D. Idol, and we're not sure what that means. Uh, he had made four or five works like this early in his career of these sort of elongated, almost haunting-like figures, and we don't know if they're real people or if they're phantoms that he dreamed up, but they have this sort of very profound and wanton and almost frightening look about them, an incredible degree of intensity. And you could make a case that it's, that it's arguably, again, about thinking back to the history of the German people and, and that these figures were, were, this kind of painting would have been unheard of in America in 1962. No one would have even, or 63, no one would have even thought about making a painting of this kind of, of angst and and, and and power. It really does reflect a character of, of the way the work was being done there. And again, he traces, in many ways, as a great German painter, he traces the history of German painting um, and the parts of it that were highlighted as profoundly good and romantic from the 19th century to the profoundly difficult of the mid-20th century. A very unusual work, if you will, by the uh, by the painter Eva Hesse, uh, who in fact is not a painter primarily, but is known as a great sculptor, uh, a work again from the early 60s. Uh, and this was really a piece, so the uh, narrative goes, uh, that we're not quite certain about, uh, is that she was a very troubled lady and was suffering all sorts of psychological problems. And her analyst, her psychiatrist, literally encouraged her to paint about what she was thinking and who, who she was. Physically, she was a brunette and a very tra attractive woman. Uh, and here she's painted a blonde with this very, uh, very, you know, almost horrific look where the eyes, one of the eyes almost has disappeared, the other is just a slash, the mouth is a swoop, and the hair is blonde, the shoulders are sort of awkward, the head is over scale. It's, it's almost as if she was ex exploring or, 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 or throwing out who she was and trying to figure it out, uh, and, and it had that sort of profundity. Literally within a couple of years of this time, she started her exploration of making these very personal sculptures, and, and that is the, her primary medium. But we were fascinated by this whole notion of how this, as one of our earliest works, dealing with this issue of the personal and the identity and psychology and who we were. This really was one of the most self-analytical works in the collection.